Hello, welcome to Inclusion Counts. My name is Rick Williams. I'm the Business Inclusion Manager for the City of Pittsburgh, Office of Equity, Office of Mayor William Peduto. Inclusion Counts is a show that educates, informs, and inspires minority women and veteran contractors across the state of Pennsylvania with a local focus. It's a monthly conversation with subject matter experts, government practitioners, and businesses that operate in the space every day. The goal of the program is to share resources, provide capacity building information, and to promote contract opportunities for vendors in this region. Our first guest today is Karen Wagen from the US Small Business Administration. Ms. Wagen is an economic development specialist where she is responsible for conducting marketing, training, and outreach efforts for 27 counties that encompass the SBA's Western Pennsylvania District Office. Karen is a designated liaison for the SBA's eight small business development center where she's responsible for resource partner compliance and award oversight. She is currently the program manager for the SBA's Emerging Leaders Program. Welcome to the show, Karen, and thank you for filling in for our recurring guest, Dave Pinkowski, this month. Well, thank you for having the SBA. We are really privileged to be here and be part of the City of Pittsburgh collaboration. Since, since you're a new guest to Inclusion Counts, um, just want to know a little bit about you. Uh, are you originally from Pittsburgh? Yes, actually, I'm from the east uh, part of Pittsburgh. I grew up in a small community called Chalfont, which is out near Wilkinsburg, um, Forest Hills, on the, near the Greensburg Pike. So, yes, I am a local. Oh, yeah, it's kind of close to the city a little bit. Uh, I used to um, live out in the Turtle Creek area. Yeah. So it's roughly about 30 minutes and driving that parkway in is always tough coming in town. So I get that. <laughs> it's a trial. It's a challenge some mornings. <laughs> um, how long have you been with the SBA? Oh, I've been with the SBA 13 years. So it's been quite an adventure. I love every minute meeting all these new business owners and some established business owners as well. And so have you always been the program manager of this Emerging Leaders Program, or you had different roles in the 13 years you've been with the SBA? I've had different roles, but um, the program has been around, I believe, since 2008. And SBA, our headquarters, selects various cities. So five years ago, back in 2016, we offered the program for the first time. And then in 2017, 2018, and 2019, I was the program manager. I was supposed to be it last year, but due to COVID, because this is a program we normally meet in person. So this year it's going to be different. It's going to be virtual. And I'm the program manager again. Yeah, I, I guess I should have stepped back and asked you a question because I asked most of the people over the last few months, you know, how have you changed your operations um, with the SBA and your programming? Um, Inclusion Counts was created because of COVID. Um, my charge was to do programming in person uh, throughout the year. And, and that's why we created this show to continue the business outreach for the city of Pittsburgh. So what type of things have you changed in the SBA as a whole? as uh, far as operations, programming, and so forth? Well, really, the same thing as you, the networking piece. You know, getting out there, you know, we cover 27 counties. So we have quite the uh, terrain. You know, we have mountainous areas. We have the rural, the small towns, the bigger towns. Um, and just trying to get out there and let people know about the programs and services through the, uh, the federal government and SBA in general. So we've done a lot of webinars, such as what we're doing here. We're conducting more training via webinars. And it seems to have worked because we have a larger reach. You know, it, it saves on people's commute. Oh, yeah. Instead and of coming through the tunnels every day from <laughs> shelf <line. laughs> Um, I, I guess let's go back and, and talk about the Emerging Leaders Program just a little bit. Um, was there a need for the SBA to create this program? Um, you already mentioned it started in 2008. Um, so was there a particular niche that they wanted to reach that they didn't before? 
No, it's a way to help businesses establish businesses because we look for businesses that have been in, oh, existence for probably like two and a half to three years and that are on that cusp of growing because there's a lot of services for entrepreneurs thinking of starting a business, but for that middle group, trying to get them to that next level. And I think that's where SBA found that there was a need and a good one too. You know, I since being the program manager, I've watched some of these businesses grow and you really like that. And the collaboration that they have between themselves, it's, it's really nice to see. Okay, let's, let's drill in a little bit more. Um, what are the major components of the program and if I'm a participant in the program, what type of takeaway should I have by being involved? Well, first of all, it's a long program. It's going to be stretched out over seven months. So we meet every other week for three hours. And during that course of the seven months, you know, I bring in some guest experts. They talk about especially your financials. I bring in financial experts. I bring in CPA firms. Uh, you learn how to do government contracting or at various levels. Maybe it is local. Maybe it's getting certified. Just so you can think about, should I take that next step? But all during this course, they are creating a three-year strategic growth plan designed for their business. And our instructor, one of the nice things about him, he's been with the program since the very beginning. This will be his fourth year as well. And he knows the program. He is great with all the business owners, trying to take them to the next level. We make connections for them. So, you know, if it's not an SBA program or service, but it's maybe something else that we can help them with. Is there a, a revenue uh, threshold or a size standard to be part of this program? Well, we do like to see businesses that are established businesses have revenues from 250000 up to $10 million. Because that's like that breaking point that, you know, you're not really a startup. You know, you are able to stand on your own. You're taking that next step. And one of the other requirements, Rick, is that they have another person in the business full time so that they can concentrate on this program. So that's a requirement. So if I'm an owner of the program, I need someone running the show while I'm in the training, so to speak, right? Because so it is can, a time commitment. Correct. So that you can concentrate on the program and help grow your business. I'm going to ask another question. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Dave's a recurring guest on the show. Um, Will participants in the Emerging Leaders Program have an opportunity to participate in the 8A program, which is the kind of the program set aside that the SBA has? Of course, you know, providing they meet the criteria for the 8A program. And of course, if they want to go into that program, you know, not everybody wants to sell to the federal government. But, you know, it, it's a great stepping stone for businesses, the training that you receive. And, you know, Emerging Leaders is free, and so is our 8A. You know, people really need, if, if they're not familiar with the Small Business Administration, please, you know, we are probably one of the best kept secrets around. Yes, you are. And hopefully, <laughs> you know, at this time, we, we really need you. Um, and I kind of like, you know, our, our program here in Inclusion Counts is a local focus. And so I want to ask about the local stats. And there's three parts that I want to get information from you on. You know, how many small businesses uh, received the training in southwestern Pennsylvania? Uh, how many jobs were created? What type of financing was provided? And how much got government contracting was secured? from businesses that were in the program. So go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, we accept into the program 20 business owners and they have to register through a portal. And we go in there and we try to get a wide range of businesses. But over the course of the year, um, there are some businesses that have dropped out because they've received contracts and they have to be able to concentrate on growing their business. Um, some have dropped out because, you know, business and life happens. You know, some have had some tragedies come through their lives, unfortunately. But I would say over the course of 
the four years that we've had it, we've probably had 65 businesses go through the program. And what we do, we follow those businesses for the, the year that they finish and two years after. So they have to fill out a survey for us to figure out if to make sure this program works. So of those, 89% of our alumni said that they have created or maintained jobs. So that means about 52 new jobs were created and 204 jobs were maintained. So that's a nice statistic from you know, the businesses that have gone through this program. And of the ones that have received federal contracting, they probably totaled six million, about $6.8 million in contracting. And that's a, another nice sum to see that, you know, maybe some have not really been involved in contracting. This is a new avenue for growth for them. And some of them have secured loans. And we're looking at probably close to half a million dollars in loans that, you know, to make businesses grow and, you know, maybe expand their product line or, you know, any number of reasons, add on new people. So it's really, the program is working. Yeah, I mean, you figure that in addition to the technical assistance along the way that the SBA provides, it's great. Um, how can local businesses find out about the program? Uh, what type of outreach are you conducting in your 27 county footprint? Uh, because we need to get this out a little bit more of what the SBA provides and then also, you know, the services and information that you have, because there's a lot of things going on uh, in our federal government with the COVID-19 relief and, and so forth. And the SBA has kind of been the center of that. So where can, where can people find the information? Well, they can go to our website at www.sba.gov, that's G-O-V. And if they are looking for information on the coronavirus, as soon as our homepage comes up, there is information right there that can direct them to the PPP, the IDOL, just different facts about it um, and other relief efforts. Also, for the emerging leaders in the search block, they can type in emerging leaders. They can also um, have my contact information they can give me a call, email me, and get more information about the program. And also, if they are interested in the program, they have to register through a link on, it's called Innerize Connect. That's the company that does our, the curriculum. So there is a link under the Emerging Leaders Program on our website that takes you directly there. Just make sure you select Pittsburgh for the drop-down box. And I'm marketing this program. We've sent it out Gov Delivery. So anytime there's announcements on programs that S our office is having, people can sign up for our Gov Delivery um, word of mouth. You know, it's like email updates. So we sent that out, and our reach probably covers 25,000 people that have signed up. So they each get an announcement about you know, emerging leaders. I've sent it out to some of the chambers. I'm trying, I sent it out to our small business development centers. You know, we can, they cover, we have eight of them that cover our whole 27 counties. So they're getting the word out. I'm talking on your show. Thank you so much today. Um, I've done a couple other guest spots where I talk about the program. So, you know, we are trying to get the word out, especially, you know, it's free. It's free. It's just your time and your commitment to the program. Yeah, we, we need to create that pipeline um, because businesses really need that support. And hopefully we'll be able to expand um, the participants in the program because it's such a good program. Um, we, we don't want it to be uh, forgotten or no one knows about it. Um, I wanted to kind of mention um, in my last question, I mentioned about COVID a little bit and the resources and so forth available. Um, some of this stuff is time sensitive and it may not be relevant when the show airs, but I do want you to kind of talk about the relief effort in, in, the, in the loan program 
that you have out of the Small Business Administration. You don't have to go into full details about it, but just the, the high level components that a small business would need if they're accessing the SBA for information. Well, you know, everything, like I said, is on our website. Some of our resource partners are holding events and as well as us, you know, we are talking about the PPP loans, you know, and the idle relief and some of our other loan programs have relief efforts built into them right now for a specific period and things keep changing constantly you know we're trying to find new ways to help maybe certain groups of people you know like the shuttered venues which is still waiting to come on board so there's a lot of programs and as updates are occurring you know it's a good idea to look at SBA's website, uh, www.sba.gov, because that's the key change. Every time they change something, they update that website. So what you see today may be changed tomorrow as we get maybe more legislation um, about how some of these programs are put together. But there is a lot of good information there. I, I do want, in your response, um, you mentioned shuttered venues. And so explain what that is. I mean, I, I did the research on it, but I think our inclusion counts people would want to know what that is and what it entails and what businesses are in the shuttered um, program space. Well, a lot of them have to do, you know, with the... Um... They were one of the hardest hit areas, whether they be theaters, music halls, it, you know, that because of COVID had to close down. You couldn't host these because they, they were considered spreading areas. So yeah, this is one of the programs that, you know, they're still writing the legislation a little bit, so I can't really talk on it, but there's some good information on our website. And that's another thing to keep checking on, especially if you are a venue that hosts, you know, like a small movie theater. Um, oh gosh, you know, there, there's so many out there. But yeah, these are programs that are out there to help the public. You know, we understand, you know, there are so many hard hit areas, especially that attracted the large groups of people. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask that and lift that up a little bit because a lot of people don't know that a movie theater can get this type of loan. And, and support, you know, our movie houses, our theaters uh, across our region, and we have a lot of them. I can't wait till they open back up to see some live entertainment. <laughs> um, and it would, you know, I think everyone's dying for it. You know, it's been close to a year that, you know, we're, we've been home we, or, you know, had limited contact with the outside. You know, I would love to get out and do the networking piece. <laughs> you and me both, you know, being at home and hosting the shows is pretty tough as it is. Um, I wanted to, you know, we're winding down. We have a few more minutes and I say to all my guests and I ask them the question, what does inclusion mean to you? <sighs> to me, it's removing those invisible and physical blockages in order to welcome in and appreciate other opinions, other ideas, thoughts and processes. Because, you know, we all learn different, but we can all learn from everybody else how you do something and how I do something may be totally different. But if I can tweak something that you do to fit my business, you, you know, it, it only behooves me to learn and be open to those. You know, and that's part of getting back to emerging leaders. You know, it's that sharing of ideas, what your business does and what my business does. They may be in totally different industries, but I can learn from your business and I can also share ways that my business has grown and hopefully it can affect yours as well. Thank you, Karen, you know, for filling in for Dave this month. I really appreciate it. You're a wealth of information. And um, hopefully we'll bring you back on the show in the future to talk about the Emerging Leaders programs and other programs from the SBA. So thank you again. Well, I appreciate the time and thank you in the city of Pittsburgh and Mayor Peduto as well. Take care now. All right, bye.
Hello, my name is Ross Chapman. I'm Maurice Matthews. I'm Dan Gilman. This is Chief Scott Schubert, City of Pittsburgh Bureau of Police. And I support ending domestic violence in the city of Pittsburgh. Because everybody has a mother. I hope to lead by example one day for my children. Because nobody should ever live in fear of their intimate partner. My mother was a victim of domestic violence, and I'm here today to say no more, not here, not in the city of Pittsburgh. And I support ending domestic violence in our city because nobody should live their life in fear. Welcome back to Inclusion Counts. Our second guest is Anita Bratina, President and CEO of PowerLink. Ms. Bratina is the shareholder, also is the shareholder and founder of All Facilities Inc. All Facilities Inc. is a research and database management company specializing in helping companies reduce operating and maintenance costs of their buildings. Her company holds one of the largest facility global management databases of real estate in this country. And I also mentioned PowerLink. She, she, she has a dual role here. Um, PowerLink founded in 1991. Its mission as a 501c3 public charity is to serve small and emerging companies to grow using an innovative, low cost, and time-tested advisory board model. Stanford University endorsed this learning model as one of the fastest ways for different students to learn in a group setting with highly targeted guest advisors. PowerLink has helped more than a thousand companies grow in the last 30 years using this unique advisory board model. Welcome to the show, Anita. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about the PowerLink Advisory Board and how it operates. How are the participants and advisors uh, selected and how often do they meet? So thank you for that question. Actually, uh, to answer it, I'd like to tell a short story. So uh, Price Waterhouse uh, and a, a business owner, a woman business owner in Washington County got their heads together and decided they wanted to form this PowerLink idea into giving advisory boards to small businesses. And so they developed the model and then they started recruiting. And they happened to call on me. And that was in 1991. And they said, you know, you already have built your company to about 200,000. You seem pretty successful. We think we can help you get to the next level. And so my answer was an immediate and resounding no. Uh, and the reason was they were gonna bring six strangers into my office to help teach me how to do better in my business than I was doing. And I was afraid of that. I was afraid of having a bunch of strangers um, find out the truth about some things that I was doing in my business that were maybe not so um, productive or successful. Um, they asked me three more times. And finally in 1992, almost a year later, I agreed to do it because they said, we need somebody who will do it. And they were having the same problem asking other business owners. Everybody said, I'm fine, I don't need your help. Um, but really we were afraid. So I finally did it. So I had my last year before PowerLink, I did $260,000 in gross annual revenue. I had seven part-time employees and they met with me for 18 months. And at the end of 18 months, I hit $1 million in gross annual revenue. And I went on to grow that company to $6 million in gross annual sales. And so what I said no to was getting advice. And what I ended up getting was a totally um, kind of an immersion in how to grow a business and how to be a CEO of a company 
And that was invaluable and pivotal for me. Um, and along with the other thousand companies that PowerLink has helped over the years. So it turns out I was the very first company to get a PowerLink advisory board. Um, and so my uh, experience was duplicated many, many times by other business owners in the Pittsburgh area. And I guess being the first participant of the program, you were able to kind of change it a little bit. So it won't be, I guess, as obtrusive, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, so I jumped back into PowerLink about five years ago and um, looked at how do we grow PowerLink? How do we make it more sustainable? And um, what I found was that it's very scary to have seven strangers come into your company and tell you what to do. So we created what, a mini advisory board model. So it's basically two advisors, uh, a facilitator, and about 10 businesses, similar to this, what Karen was talking about with her emerging leaders. We have about 12 people in our group. We meet monthly for 90 minutes. We meet over Zoom and uh, we have different kinds of businesses in each group. So we right now in Western Pennsylvania have 15 community advisory board meetings every month. Uh, and we uh, have, we are helping about 160 companies right now in those okay. groups. And let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Is it industry focused? You know, if I'm a, go ahead, I'll just let you go ahead. Yeah. So actually we didn't start out that way. We just started out with, you know, here's a time of day, here's a location, Eaton Park, back room, you know, can you come? Um, we always worked with uh, partners. So the Chamber of Commerce, the SBDC, the, uh, so we always had somebody referring people to the meetings, but after COVID, um, we just started to do outreach differently. So we now have four different types of groups. We have um, retail and like, I'll call it urban hub um, kinds of businesses um, in three groups. We have um, contractors only. So uh, people in construction, design, um, facilities management, that are, uh, and facility services that are um, in another group. We have, um, we're just launching a new program through Huntington where we're gonna be opening up um, groups specifically around government contracting. Um, so I'll be very interested to talk to Karen about what they're doing because we're building a model for our community advisory board for government contracting. And we are also doing one for um, uh, diversity set aside of any kind. So, you know, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh, Highmark, they all have um, diversity and inclusion uh, goals. And we feel that we can help our clients to learn how to get access to those contracts. I was going to ask that question. You kind of jumped me, jumped, jumped the gun on a little bit because I wanted to, to kind of set it up a little bit where we find out more about what the participant gets out of the advisory board participating because it is a commitment, just like we heard with Karen. You know, it's a long stretch that people have yeah. to spend their time to do. And what's their what's the takeaway? If I'm a a power link participant, you know, what type of things should I expect um, being in the program? So there's four things that, that our owners tell us they're getting out of the program. Um, number one, um, we have a lot of owners who cannot figure out how to go from $50,000 a year to $250,000 a year. That's a really big jump for I'd say 90% of the small businesses out there. Uh, the average small business in America only does about $100,000 a year. So um, we have to help them learn how to get from 50 to uh, 250. And that's by uh, looking at their pricing, their value proposition. In other words, how are they 
different, better, smarter than the next guy doing the same thing or gal. And um, the third thing is we're looking at their um, ability to do both sales and operations because at that level, most owners are doing everything. So what we do is work with them to figure out what are you good at? What should you be doing? And how do you start to let go of some of the things that you're not so good at so that you can grow your business? Um, and the last thing is uh, we have a surprising number of owners who, who are doing their businesses as a side hustle. So they've got a full-time job and they're doing this at night. Uh, I, I was, the, that was me. I started my business while I had a corporate job and I did it on the side and I did it for almost a year before I left that job um, to start my business. So we have a surprising number of companies that that is exactly what they're doing. And what we're trying to help them figure out is at what point can you quit? What do you have to do in that business on the side to reach a point where you can quit your job? Um, and again, it involves those same basic things, but try doing that while you're also working full time. So uh, we, we actually are starting a group just for that. People with, that are, have a business as a side business, in addition to working full time, and we're hosting those meetings in the evenings so that um, they don't have to interfere with their work day uh, to join the meetings. So what would be those key things for someone to make that transition um, for, I guess, you know, working their job and then working their business at the same time? So what things that would they have to look at to, to make a determination and saying, OK, I'm going to leave this corporate job. And if you have to use your experience as an example to share with our Inclusion Counts viewers, um, feel free to do that. Yeah, so it's a really common problem um, that uh, starts with kind of some private consultation. So we actually sit with each of our owners for two or three hours before they join the group, the advisory board, because we really want to understand, um, do you know what it's going to take for you to get from 35000 a year to 100000 a year? What, what does that look like? And what we find oftentimes is it's kind of like, how do you cross the Grand Canyon? You know, uh, you know what the other side looks like, but exactly how do you cross the Grand Canyon? And that's what we spend a lot of time working on with our owners is what could, what are two or three ways you could cross the Grand Canyon so you can quit your job? Um, and that's actually mapping out plans. Um, and uh, another thing that we do is look at the size of the customers. So usually with a side hustle, your average sale is very small. Um, no one's trying to get a $100,000 contract when they're, when they're doing it on the side. So we actually sit with them and brainstorm on, if you got a $100,000 contract, who would do it? How, how would you do that? Um, and uh, I actually have a um, African-American woman who's got a great side hustle business. She's got a full-time job. And we decided that her best bet would be to try to go through the diversity procurement uh, arm of either UPMC or Pitt, because what she does would be well uh, received by both organizations to try to get a larger contract where she could bring in some of her outside contractors, turn them into W-2 employees and actually service the business while she was still working um, because $100,000 wasn't enough for her to quit her job. So what we do is we actually take every single company and figure out what is your plan. And then the meetings are to help execute the plan. So, um, that's how we are helping companies and, and very successfully, by the way. So I guess it's like a shared approach and, and basically PowerLink is that team and helping you reach that goal. That's our goal, Rick. We're, we feel that every business owner is unique. Their personality is unique. Their business experience is unique. Their goals for their company are unique. And it's impossible to really... Um, 
help all businesses with the same advice. Uh, it's just not possible. So we use our private meetings, um, similar to how we used to do the private meetings with advisory boards, where it was one company and then multiple advisors. But instead, we just use facilitators and our regional directors to map out with our owners what should, what, let's, let's look at plans you're comfortable with, and then we go recruit advisors to help them. So um, when we put somebody into one of our community advisory boards, we are, they have already decided what they want to do, and they're using the advisory board setting to help them get there. Okay, so you do some type of assessment before yeah. they enter the, the PowerLink, uh, I guess, family, so to speak, right? Yes, that's a great way to say it. You know, our focus is minority and women and veterans. So uh, what the percentage of um, minority women and veterans are on, I guess, they're in your queue as far as clients um, PowerLink clients receiving services? Um, great question. So um, we have about 160 companies that we're serving now. About 25% are minority owned. Um, in total, about 70% are woman owned. And um, veteran owned, <laughs> I think we have one. Um, and and he's not using his certification for anything. He just happens to be a veteran. So um, uh, that is an area that we would like to improve. We, we would like to improve at all areas. Uh, we're, we're now, um, you know, Huntington is helping us get access to other organizations that really are working very closely with business owners in communities that are African-American, that are uh, women owned. And so we're starting to work with new partners who can help us get access to people who were just like me, afraid, you know, afraid of what we didn't know, afraid of um, what people would think if we were to say out loud what we were afraid of. And um, we are kind of gently tugging them and pulling them into our programs through new partners. Yeah, I mean, it's a safe place um, and you're creating that safe place for people to vent, for people to grow uh, in Paralink, uh, to provide that that mentoring uh, that's much needed uh, yep. for the businesses that are out there. Um, and that's a great thing. And so the partners, you know, you know, how can the various partners, you know, what role do they play? Um, you already mentioned the Paralink model. So how would your resource partners come into play to help these businesses? So um, that's a great question also. So uh, in different ways, but we look to, so we're starting a program in downtown Washington, PA, in Little Washington. And um, our partners are PCRG and the Downtown Washington Organization, um, which is an economic development organization there. Um, and they work with the city of Washington. So uh, our goal is to create at least three community advisory boards to serve the retail uh, and downtown area, to serve um, any African-American companies that are looking for diversity procurement opportunities um, and women-owned and veteran-owned. So we have like a diversity group and then we're also looking for something I didn't mention earlier, but every uh, life cycle of a company, they reach a point where they're ready to retire. And what we found in our market is a lot of business owners have been struggling for years to keep their businesses alive. And now they're approaching retirement and they're not sure what to do. So we've created a special group just for succession. And we, um, will teach them the four or five ways you can exit a business um, and help them again, sit down and figure out what's their plan. And then we have some great advisors who are helping. Um, yeah, uh, you know, you allowed me to kind of sit in one of your sessions and there was a gentleman that would, had a business, but he still wanted to continue to work and I think the conversation was around succession planning and, and moving the business forward, um, still be part of the business and being able to com 
the, the, to provide that capacity uh, to an organization to support it. So how does that element come into play as you look at a life cycle of a business uh, from, I guess, the startup phase, you have a couple years in, and then you have that midterm thing, and then you have that succession planning moving forward. So are you working on that element as well uh, in PowerLink, providing that type of services? So we kind of discovered it by accident because when you've been in business for 30 years as a nonprofit, the people that you first served in you know, the early years are now ready to retire. Um, I am one of those people, right? So I've been in business for a long, long time. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna be turning 65 this year. So if I haven't been thinking about it, uh, believe me, now I am. And what I've learned is it's a five-year strategy. You cannot just decide, wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna sell my business uh, or I'm gonna pass my business to my kids or I'm gonna sell my business to my employees. Uh, so um, we established a five-year plan for a five-year advisory board for anyone in succession. And that's how we do it. So we've put together wealth management people, attorneys, uh, mergers and acquisition specialists. And um, we have a, a, like a, um, a, a CFO type person who can help you look at your books and figure out kind of what your val how to value your company. Um, and they sit in those meetings. And as we come across people that we're interviewing about their plan, sure enough, we discover um, it doesn't ma really matter where they are, downtown Washington, downtown Pittsburgh, you know, uh, in Chalfont, it doesn't matter. Um, somebody at some point says, I, I need to figure out a way to get out of this business. And that's where we come in. And I think we're going to continue to see that grow too. Because um, people get tired, you know, of, of um, climbing up the mountain every morning. Um, so we, um, uh, we think we're, we're putting together a great advisory board for that group. That's great. It seems like you're, you're covering the whole life cycle of someone's business and someone's life. You know, uh, yeah. some businesses don't, you know, they don't want it. Their children don't want the business. They don't have an interest in it, um, but they still want the business is still needed in the space. Yes. And so how do you kind of manage that? And PowerLink provides that. Um, we're winding down a little bit as um, far as the end of the show. Um, and my last question, I guess, what does inclusion mean to you? So I thought about that question a lot. I'm glad um, that you asked. So we are very um, sensitive to that because what we found from working with women-owned businesses, from working with minority businesses, um, I can't really say too much about the veteran-owned yet, but um, every business is unique and everyone's mindset about business is unique. So what people are afraid of, you know, I was afraid that uh, I could not compete against a guy in the space that I was in. I thought that if I was going after a large contract that I would lose because I was a woman. That my, was my mindset. Um, that doesn't make it right or wrong. It was simply my mindset. So inclusion to me means that uh, we somehow help you to see that there are ways to get over that. There are ways to overcome that. And, and there are probably more than one way to overcome it. So kind of seeing how to cross the Grand Canyon, no matter who you are, how, um, what your beliefs are about your future success, um, and no matter what your capacity is, we believe that every business owner is trainable if they have a mindset that they really wanna do more than they're doing now. Wow, great answer. 
you know, hopefully the city of Pittsburgh and, you know, our office of equity and office of business diversity will be able to help you take these businesses across the Grand Canyon. You know, we want them to win, you know, because that helps our city become more inclusive. You know, absolutely. Um, Anita, thank you for your time and, and in sharing your insights and your personal story um, with PowerLink and all facilities and and um, hopefully you won't be um, a stranger to our show. Um, I, I, I think that. It. And Rick, I would love to bring back some of our owners, you know, who really are the ones that should tell the story for us because uh, it wasn't just me that's been helped. There's so many companies that have been helped by PowerLink. And um, uh, I, I feel grateful actually that I've gotten a chance to come back to PowerLink and help um uh, all over again and, and it sounds like you'll have a legacy uh for another business owner to take on that responsibility moving forward when you decide to succeed on and it sounds like <laughs> you have your five-year plan in place right there you go. <laughs> but again there you go. anita thank you you're a wealth of information you're a great collaborator and please um Come back to the show sometime and, and thank you for your time today on Inclusion Counts. Thank you so much, Rick. Appreciate it. Take care.